Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright. This is Call to War, Directive Number Two. I have uh, some very specific things to discuss with you today, but before I get into that, there's just a couple of points I need to cover just to uh, try to get on the same page with some folks. Uh, There's a lot of questions out there what this is all about. This is about one thing. This is about seeing the promise of God that the Lord Jesus Christ made on the day he first declared that he was going to build his church. He called those things that are not as though they were. He called the end before the beginning. And he told the end of all of this, and that is that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. Now, I am a literalist. That's the way my brain works. I drive through a neighborhood and I see a sign that says, slow children at play. My brain reads, slow children at play. And I have said to my wife at times, why would somebody want to advertise that there are slow children that live in this neighborhood? That's my bright, my br- I see literally, I hear literally. And uh, so that has been very, very much my approach in reading the Word of God. I read what's there. I take it literally. Uh, I realize there are some things that are figurative, but in principle, I take those things literally. And I believe them just like they said. And I'm not, I, I haven't become God's apologist how, why, at, at where I'm trying to explain away what he obviously said and meant what he said to a world that no longer likes hearing that or to my crowd, my church crowd, that would might not be happy if they thought I believe that God literally meant whatever the verse says. So that's my passion. My passion is the word of God. My passion is the word of God. I am sold out to the word of God. Now, I'm not going to go into my testimony today. It's been recorded a couple of times, different different situations. But uh, when I went to the Naval Academy, I had been raised in Pentecost all my life, the United Pentecostal Church. Not It wasn't the United Pentecostal Church International then. It was just the United Pentecostal Church. And I, my mother was attending United Pentecostal Church when I was born. I'd been raised in that all my life. Uh, I did not know that I only had a relationship with the church. I didn't have a relationship with God. I know the difference. I live the difference. And in the will of God, he sent me to the U.S. Naval Academy on June the 30th, 1964. And by the time Christmas came around, sitting around in those study hour uh, uh, discussions, and there were groups that talked about women and groups that talked about politics, and there were groups that talked about the Bible, and I was always in the one talking about the Bible because I was a typical Pentecostal kid that knew it all and was sure the whole world was going to hell and that they were blind and ignorant. And so that's the way I was raised. That's the way I was raised to think. Fact. And so... And I went, my dad was in the Navy. I went to seven different churches in seven different areas of the United States. So it wasn't a regional attitude. It was a body attitude. And uh, I went to those study hours. I found out that I could only regurgitate what my Sunday school teacher taught, what my, what my uh, youth leader taught, what my pastors said. I didn't know the Bible for myself. It wasn't my doctrine. It was my church's doctrine. And in that situation, I could I could not defend myself. I was sure I could and could not because those guys knew their Bible. And I did not know my Bible. I only knew my doctrine that I had been taught. I believed it, but I couldn't defend it. And by the time they were through, I didn't even know what I believed. And I've testified many times how that I got a study Bible for my 21st birthday in February of 1965, my 19th birthday, excuse me, in February of 1965. And for the next two years, I spent almost all my available time either studying the Bible or taking what God was showing me and going back to those those discussion groups and to see if they could tear apart what God was giving me for myself. And after two years, they could not. And uh, at that point in time, I did not believe what the United Pentecostal Church believed anymore. 
I was, I left the, the Naval Academy and returned to membership of the United Pentecostal Church because there wasn't one here. Uh, my wife and I started the first one here in Annapolis, Maryland in uh, September of 1970. So I couldn't return to the United Pentecostal Church here because there wasn't one to go to. But after I graduated, I went back. But I've said this many times publicly, and I mean every word of it. I am not a member of the United Pentecostal Church because I believe what the United Pentecostal Church believes. I'm a member of the United Pentecostal Church because I believe that the United Pentecostal Church teaches the closest to what I what God showed me in the Bible for myself. And my loyalty, first and foremost, when it comes to truth, is what the Bible says. Now, as a district superintendent, I support the manual and at times have to enforce the manual. But I believe what the Bible says. I believe what the Bible says. And if there was a time that what the manual says or what the Bible says, I believe was in contradiction, I would not be able to support what the manual says. I'd have to support what the Bible says. So with that being the case, again, I read... And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'm going, okay, this is wonderful. He's going to build the church on a rock, not, not Petra uh, or, or Petros, which is Peter, but rock, which is Petra, which is a huge rock, like kind of like uh, uh, Gibraltar. Upon this rock I'll build my church. So there's stability, there's durability, et cetera, et cetera. And I, he's going to build the church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Wait, wait, a, wait a minute. How can you give a definitive statement of conclusion on the first day? That you, the first time the word is church is mentioned in the Bible, he gives a definitive statement of conclusion upon this, and the gates of hell should not prevail against the church. So my question as was for years, and I prayed about it and studied it. So how do we get from the initial building of the church that started at 6 a.m. On, uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, beginning both the, the church and the new covenant that day? And I'd love to talk about that, but I don't have time in this session. How do you get from the beginning of it to the end of it? Because we all know, while the beginning's important, it's the end that counts. How do we get there? How do we get to this promise? And the gates of hell should not prevail against the church. Well, I'm going to tell you what, my friend. I went to a military school. I know what that terminology means. Both in the culture of that day and the type of warfare in that day and what it means today. There's no place in history that gates were ever used as an offensive weapon. Gates were always what you put into wars, in, excuse me, into walls. Because if you had something you wanted to protect against mar marauding uh, bands of, uh, of thieves or, 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 or plunderers uh, or against nations' armies, you built walls. And the more sturdy the walls, the more safer everybody was on the inside of them. Well, then, the walls that keep people out keep you in. So you got to be able to come and go, even though you want to protect everything. So you build gates. So you can come and go. Well, because the gate is the weak point in the wall, that's the part that you send most of your troops to, to defend. It's the weak point, and you defend it with the most seasoned troops. And because of that, the leaders of the city felt the safest doing the business of the city in the gates of the city, which is biblical terminology used all the time. And so therefore, the gates not only were the only way to get in and out of, 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 what, of, of the walls and what's inside those walls, but it also represented the authority of the one who built those walls and the one trying to keep safe or captive what's inside those walls. Well, let me tell you something. Those walls aren't made out of sugar. They're not going to melt in the rain. You can pray all the downpour of the Holy Ghost you want. That doesn't take care of those walls. Three times Jesus said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that if you're going to spoil the city, 
you got to bind the strong man and then you can spoil his house. But we ignore that. I've been raised in this. I've had a license of 51 years. We've been raised in this. We've been raised in, I was raised in this. The first time I heard anything about uh, spiritual warfare was from Brother Billy Cole. We were trying to have revival in this city. My wife and I were here trying to build a church. We had people coming to church. We couldn't pray anybody through. And I, I, somebody gave me a cassette tape of him talking about the revival they had in Thailand and how that they had prayed, baptized all these people. Nobody got the Holy Ghost. And he said, God, what's going on? And God said, you, got to, you haven't defeated the prince of Thailand. And, and this is his testimony. I learned spiritual warfare. The first time I ever heard about anything about spiritual warfare was from Apostle Billy Cole. So you can reject me all you want, but you're rejecting Billy Cole. You willing to do that? Because he's the one that taught all this stuff. He's the one that taught me intercessory, war, intercessory prayer. And he did it just like I have done it at the instruction of the Holy Ghost at times. He was uh, from West Virginia when I first came to Maryland. Maryland, West Virginia, well, one district. And I, uh, <laughs> I, we had our conferences together. And I don't know why he was drawn to me, but he, he initiated the contact. He came to me and said, uh, the Lord has told me I'm supposed to spend some time with you. I'm supposed to come preach for you. <laughs> well, you know, if Brother Billy Cole says he's coming to your place, there's only one resp response. Yes, sir. When you coming? Well, he came for several years. And it was one year. I It was a couple years after he'd come. He, he was coming like two, three, sometimes four times a year at that time. And... Uh, one trip, I picked him up at the airport. He got in the car, and I started on him. I, 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 the Lord was working my motor over. I wanted to know what spiritual warfare was. I wanted to know what intercessory prayer was. I, all my life, the people that prayed intercessory prayer were the people that were depressed and down all the time, and they had such a load on them, they had no joy. And they were the ones who prayed intercessory warfare. You watch those folks. That's the last thing you want to do was be an intercessory prayer warrior. Well, Brother Cole wasn't like that. So I'm asking these questions. Back then, it took about 35, 40 minutes to get from the airport to my house. And the whole time, I, one more question, Brother Cole, one more question. And I had gotten to him a little bit, I think, by the time we pulled up on the curb in front of my house. And... Uh, he said, come in this house. I'm going to teach you spiritual warfare. Yes, sir. Yeah, let's do it. You know, I, whatever. So we got out of the car, walked up the sidewalk into, into the front door of my house. He barely greeted my wife. He pointed to, to, to the two of us, get on your knees. We did, right there. No, no, no questions asked. He said, do it. You did it. Then he got on his knees. He looked at two, the two of us and said, this is, is intercessory prayer. He threw his hands up and boom, just like that, started praying. And he didn't do it a minute or two. He probably went 10, 15 minutes. And the place is shaken in the spirit. I mean, the spirit world is absolutely shaking. And that bore witness in my spirit with what I experienced when we couldn't break through, and after I listened to his cassette tape in 71 about his message about defeating the prince of Thailand, and I didn't know anything else to do, so I did what he did. I called for the little handful of people we had, all move-ins, and uh, I called for them. At, well, excuse me, two had the Holy Ghost, but we had to take them someplace else for them to get the Holy Ghost, and I prayed for them. Uh, and, and, I, and so there were seven of us between my wife and I and a couple of move-ins and the couple of people we prayed through, there was seven of us. And we met in the, in the upstairs of my house. And for seven days straight, we fasted and prayed, met every evening for prayer. Because that's what Brother Cole did. That's what he said do. They did. And so I didn't know anything else. I never heard a thing. So, Lord, if that worked for Thailand, it's going to work for Annapolis, Maryland. And on the last night, 
the last Friday night of November 1971. The, uh, the authority of God came on me like I'd never experienced it before. And I bound the prince of Annapolis, just like he, I heard him say he did the prince of Thailand. And the Holy Ghost thundered through me. That weekend, we prayed our first people through. It happened to be the first weekend of December 1971. And we prayed through 11 people that month after having nobody get the Holy Ghost in our services from the beginning to that date. And the same exact spirit I felt in that room the night that I spoke in authority against that principality of Annapolis was the same exact spirit I felt in my living room some four years later when Brother Cole was praying intercessory prayer. Praise God. Now, you may think he's weird. I'm in that club. If I'm weird, he's weird. I'm doing exactly what he did. You got a, you got a tough choice there to make. Some of you do. Because I learned every bit of this from him. All, all the, the concept, the revelation of it, all I've done is study as God added more understanding and scripture to it over the years. But the spirit of, of warfare, spiritual warfare, came on me listening to a tape, a cassette tape of Brother Cole's testimony. And the spirit of intercessory prayer came on me in my living room as he prayed and imparted it to me about 1975 or so. And that's, this is it. And I realize today, I'm so sorry to say that the great majority of the United Pentecostal Church International, even if they acknowledge spiritual warfare, they don't have a clue how to do it, don't have a clue what to do, I know that offends some people. Facts are facts. You can't walk up, you couldn't walk up to the average saint at general conference and say, in, uh, in 25 words or less, explain to me spiritual warfare. They couldn't do it. I wonder even how many of our people have ever even cast out a devil, which Jesus said was going to be one of the signs of believers. In fact, it was the first one in a list of five. Well, we don't talk about that, and we don't teach that, and we sure don't practice that. Well, sorry, I believe the Bible. You do what you will. I believe the Bible. And I'm pursuing everything that's in the book. I'm not being selective and just picking out the stuff that I can draw a crowd with and that I can please a crowd with. And so God has called his church. It is the will of God. It is the timing of God now for there to be an effort of those that will to come against the gates of hell. Now, there's a lot of folks, they say they don't believe in this. What they're really saying is, I'm afraid to do it. I don't want to stir the devil up. Well, you got your faith, and that is, if you confront him, he's bigger and better than your God, he's going to beat you up really bad. You can believe what you want. I believe what I want. Greater is he that's within me than he that's in the, the, the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That's book. Where's your book for leaving him alone? Where's your book for avoiding him? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and wicked spirits in the atmosphere. Well, are you wrestling? Are you avoiding? No. So I'm speaking to those that want to do this, but you're afraid. You want to do this, but you don't know how to do this. Well, <clears throat> this morning in prayer, I, 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 uh, <clears throat> yesterday morning in prayer, I was told that I was going to be doing directives all this week live at noon Eastern time. And then I've, I've got direction for each one of those days. And then I'm going to be doing, uh, you know, we're going to, we're trying to set up the zoom directives for those that will sign up by email <clears throat> and those that want to participate, you're willing to submit your church to participate. It is 
CTW Zoom at ApostolicIron.com. Apostolic Iron Together. CTW Zoom at ApostolicIron.com. You send that in, say, my church, I'm a pastor, my church, or if you're not a pastor, you're a minister. If you're under a local pastor as your authority, you cannot participate without his agreement, his or her agreement. You're going to have to have with your desire, your email saying you want to participate, you have to have a letter from them saying that they've given you a part, uh, authority as your covering to participate. Now, if you're a pastor of your own local assembly, and it's your call. If you're a bishop, you're an evangelist, you're a prophet, you're whatever, uh, your participation is your call. If you're an official, your participation is your call. But uh, I cannot let saints be on these Zoom meetings. I can't. I've been preaching like everybody else has been preaching and teaching uh, all this these couple of months up to now because nobody else has put uh, a disclaimer on their videos, this is just for preachers. I haven't done it either. You can put yours out there. Anybody can watch it. So can I. But now, now, because we're now actually moving into leading and participating in leading this uh, call to war 2020 effort against the gates of hell, against the spirit of iniquity that's already at work in this world and doing a pretty good job of it from the devil's perspective. Uh, if you want to participate in that, uh, then there's going to have to be some training. So if you want to participate but you're not sure what to do, you're welcome to go ahead and sign up because there's going to be plenty of guidance along here. But along with that, in addition to the seven or the, 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 the five live directives that are being done this week at noon Eastern Daylight Time, next week, <laughs> the Lord loves to set me up. Next week, I'm going to be doing uh, at 9 a.m. in the morning each day, Eastern Daylight Time, my time. I'm going to be praying my pro daily warfare prayer and streaming it because the easiest way for people to learn is by example, by demonstration. And they can pray along with me. It's not going to be two-way communication. I'm just going to pray as the Holy Ghost leads me. And those that are participating can feel and, and, and participate and hear and feel how you do warfare prayer. Now, there is no one way to do it. Those four, five prayers, Monday through Friday, will not be the same. They will not be the same link. They will not be the same approach. As the Holy Ghost leads, I will pray warfare just like I do every day. And someday, some days the, my warfare prayer is, or I call it also ministry prayer, is uh, definitely less than an hour, and some days it's several hours. I don't determine that, and I don't predetermine that. I allow the Holy Ghost to lead because this day is his, and every day is his, and I'm his, so he can do with me whatever he chooses on any one of those days. So uh, I, I want to I just give you the high points today. This, uh, this lesson today, or directive today, is actually the outline that God gave me two mornings ago. He woke me up speaking these things to me. I had to get up quickly and start, start writing them down in my iPad. And uh, so I put, I put them into a, an overview lesson that I'm calling directive number two. And starting tomorrow... Uh, I will be in the studio beginning to record each one of those these lessons, and there's 36 of them in this. And I'm going to say to you in advance, as I go through this today, for some of you, this is going to be very discouraging because you're going to see how much you don't know about all this. Because what the Lord said to me, he said, he woke me up with, these are the essential things that a person must have and know and know how to do in order to win consistently at spiritual warfare in conflict with the enemy. Now, we're not talking about survival resistance. Survive the devil and he'll flee from you. That's, that, that's how you survive, just by resisting the devil. But the church came against the gates of hell, and we have a promise that those gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. 
And so therefore, you got to go on the attack. Gates are not offensive weapons. Walls are not offensive weapons. It's all defensive. So if the gates can't prevail against the church, the church has to be on the offensive, has to be on the attack. Now, my question is this. Just what percentage of the body of Christ would you say on any given day is truly on the attack in the spirit against the kingdom of darkness? I, I'm sorry, I'm not a novice at this. <laughs> I've had the Holy Ghost 62 plus years. I've had a license over 50 years, well over 50 years. And I'm telling you right now, actually over 51 because I met the district board in Florida for my local license in, in, in November of 1970. No, excuse me. 1968, excuse me. So I've had, uh, I've had a license over 51 years. I'm not a novice with this. Been there. And I'm telling you right now, I've prayed with hundreds and thousands of people collectively and individually and in small groups in my 50-plus years. And I'm telling you right now, if 1% of the body of Christ has any real idea of what to do in spiritual warfare, I'd be shocked. They don't know how to do what Billy Cole taught me. I don't mean that disrespectfully, calling Billy Cole, Brother Billy Cole. Not at all. They don't know how to do what he taught me. They don't know how to do what he what he testified to on that cassette tape I watched. And I know he gave that testimony because of the times one year, because it's on it's on YouTube right now. You can watch him give that testimony to the entire because of the time service that night. And yet, and yet, I wonder how many people left that service going. We just heard direction from God. We need to pursue learning how to do this. Oh, no. That's Billy Cole. He's up here with the rest of us down here. We will never be like him. Really? Then he is somebody different than Jesus. Because Jesus said, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And let me tell you something right now. Any preacher that presents themselves as being so special that there's nobody else like them and there can be nobody else like them, run. I don't mean walk away. Run away. They will cost you their, your soul. They'll cost you your soul. Elijah, bemoan, oh God, I'm the last one left. And God says, what are you talking about? I got 7,000 more reserved to myself. So anybody comes across like, and I'm going to tell you right now, I, 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 Brother Cole was in my home and in our pulpit many times. And not only that, I heard him minister many times. And never, and he spent all the, uh, he spent some time over at Kent Christian College videoing, teaching, and training. And not one time did he have the attitude that I'm this and there's nobody else like me and nobody else can do this. Why do you think he hauled all those people to Ethiopia all those years? Not so they could admire how great he was, but so somehow they would catch the vision of and the faith that he had for hundreds and thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's why they went with him. That's why they went with him. You can do what you want to with this. God knows this is truth. He came to me one day and said, Brother Wright, yes, sir. I just want you to know why I've never invited you to Ethiopia. I said, okay, if you need to tell me, but I'm okay. I'm fine. He said, I haven't invited you to Ethiopia because you never needed to go. I never one time questioned how many people were getting the Holy Ghost over there. I knew Brother Cole. I knew the way God used Brother Cole. And I also fully understood why he was hauling all those people over there all those years. Because they weren't going to get it on their own. They needed to see it. They needed to experience it. My question is, how many came home with faith that God would use them like that? 
No, that's what we do with people. We take men of God that are mightily used and put them on some pedestal so that we don't have to be challenged by them and we don't have to try to listen to what they're teaching and we don't have to receive the impartation of what they're giving. Well, those of you that want to be a part of this spiritual warfare effort, that God has talked to you, that he's drawing on you to do it, but your fear and your awareness that you don't know how to do this is preventing you from doing it, then just hang around. God's going to help you. Because the first thing that's going to be imparted is the spirit of it. The second thing that's going to be imparted is the revelation of it. And then third, the thing will be imparted is, the, is how to do it. And the fourth thing that will be imparted is on the biblical foundation of it all. And that's exactly the opposite of the way that I would prefer to do it and that you would do it in normal times. You want to do the biblical foundation of it, then you want to teach how to do it, and then you want to give the spirit of it, and then you want to demonstrate it so people can participate with you. But these are not normal times. This is no longer a normal day or hour. This is God's time. And for those that are in tune with the Holy Ghost and are hearing what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church, you want to do something about it. You're just not sure what to do and how to do it. Well, the Lord's going to help you. And I, I have to believe for my own soul's sake and my own mind's sake, I have to believe that there are many others out there that God's saying the same thing through. Even if I haven't heard it, I don't have to hear it to know God is speaking to his people. And they may not say it exactly like I'm saying it or the way I'm saying it, but they're saying it. I know some young men of God, and I say young when you're 74. Everybody under that's young, aren't they? Everybody under 50 is young. Uh, but I know some men of God in their 20s and 30s that God is saying some stuff to. And they call themselves evangelists because that's all they can get away with right now. But they have a true prophetic ministry. And the Holy Ghost is saying stuff to them. And they may, they, they may say it a little different than I'm saying it. But the principles are exactly the same and the passion's the same. The faith is the same. The confidence is the same. And God's using them to say it to those that'll listen. I could give you names. I'm not going to do that. It wouldn't be fair to them. But I could right now. And I'm not talking about two or three. I'd probably need minimum of two hands full to even remotely cover the ones that I know personally that God is using and talking to and saying the same things through and to. And you know what? Many of them have already signed up to be a part of this because they recognize it's what God's doing. This isn't about a man. It's not about a person or a personality. People that are using that excuse are only doing it to justify ignoring it. That's the only reason they're doing it. They're just trying to ignore it. Well, that's okay. That's, that's not, had nothing to do with me. <laughs> like the Lord said to Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. I don't take that personal. This isn't about me. It's about you and Jesus and going forward. So there's a couple of things, I, and I'm going to be reading a lot of this just because I got to cover a lot of ground in a few minutes, and I'm putting this out here. I'm not going to be able to comment very much about each one of these points because I'm going to be teaching about each one of them. But here are things that God wants to have and is trying to put in our lives if he hasn't already put in our lives so that we can absolutely stand. Paul said, when you've done all to stand, stand therefore. Put on the whole armor of God so that, verse 18 of Ephesians 6, you can war in the spirit. Jesus' name. So this, uh, the, these uh, uh, 24 hour days of prayer that we're doing, those that are participating one day a week, different churches around the world. I've had nations sign up to be a part of this for themselves. They're doing it themselves. <clears throat> the only reason we're signing up is so it can be a coordinated effort. You choose what day of the week. You choose how long the prayer links in that chain are. You choose how you're going to fast that day. Not me. I'm not doing that. 
There just needs to be some coordination. Why? Because a scattered army with every part of it doing its own thing is an army that loses. How many times in the history of warfare has a some more superior army lost because their, their movements weren't coordinated? And a smaller army that was coordinated routed them. And greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. How can we be routed by the devil? Because we're everyone doing its own thing, every man running to his own tent. You know what, right now, you can pray spiritual warfare on your own. Uh, pick out your casket, spiritual or literal. Not because you can't win, but because the stakes have been so upped by God in all this, and the devil's aware of this, he's going to pick off every lone wolf that he can find. Because if one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. And by that mathematics, three can put a hundred thousand to flight. And four can put a million to flight. So there is absolutely a biblical principle in joining together in a coordinated effort. But a coordinated effort of what? There's, a, there's some people that are, since the 1st of May, starting on the 1st of May, there are people, the churches that have been having their 24-hour prayer chain. But you know what the Holy Ghost told me? They're just praying good prayers. Some of them are just praying in the Spirit, good prayers. Very few that are praying in those prayer chains are praying warfare prayer. Why? They don't know the difference. So this is... This spiritual warfare is, is not warfare, it is spiritual warfare. Therefore, it's not possible to do biblical spiritual warfare except by, through, and with the Spirit of God. The Greek definition trans, of, the, of, of the English word translated spiritual, according to Thayer's, means to both be filled with the Spirit and governed by the Spirit. Only those who are spiritual can successfully do spiritual warfare. Those who are not cannot. So it's not, you're not spiritual because you're filled with the Holy Ghost. You're spiritual because you're both, both filled with the Holy Ghost and submitted to the Spirit of God every day, to the will of the Father every day. We are not doing 24-hour prayer chains. We are doing 24-hour spiritual warfare prayer, prayer chains. And I'm calling on every leader who's wanting to participate to make this very clear with your people. And you need to begin to try to teach them the difference. And if you don't know the difference, and there is plenty of scripture at, at, at right now today, today, when I get off here, I'm going to instruct that the, uh, uh, the 2011 Call to War syllabus, which is over 200 pages, in a PDF format, will be placed onto uh, apostoliciron.com under downloads. And for the next, for the rest of this week, you can have it at no charge. You can have it. Study it. Read it. That was written in 2011 for the first, very first call to war that we had here in Annapolis. It's still biblical truth today. It is solid scriptural evidence. It's 200 pages of scripture after scripture. Mostly scripture, not a lot of me talking. Unlike most books, there are a lot of the author talking and a few scriptures scattered in to try to support their points. Give me until 2 p.m. today, Eastern Daylight Time, to have it up on apostoliciron.com under downloads. It is the spiritual warfare syllabus from 2011. It's PDF. You can get it. I, I know people that have taught every page of that to their church. So there's material available. There's something to start with. And if you don't see this for yourself in the Bible, you can get that and study it for yourself. But pastor, if you want your people to be involved, you need to teach them how to do this. And then I'm going to supply supplemental tip material of teaching that you can use or not use. Your job, your, your, your call, your business.
All of it will be available, or all of the series teachings uh, will be available on Bible with the Bishop channel on YouTube. And I'm going to start recording them tomorrow, and they'll have the first ones up in a few days. But until then, you can download Call to War uh, syllabus from apostoliciron.com, downloads, uh, no cost. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to give your email. You don't have to do anything. Just go on there and download it and use it. You cannot sell it. There was a well-known evangelist that was a part of that first call to war, and uh, I gave him a syllabus, and uh, he took 20, 30 pages at least directly out of the syllabus, put it into his manual, and never gave me credit. And I've never said a word to him about it. He doesn't even know I know. I knew right away. I knew exactly what he did. Fine. If he wants to take credit for somebody else's writing, that's fine. I don't own any of this. Everything I've got, I received. But that's what he's done. It's what he did. To my knowledge, he still sells that spiritual warfare syllabus that he didn't write a significant portion of. So you can have it. It's yours free. If he'd have asked me, I would have told him, sure, no problem, man. I believe in you, believe in what you're doing. Take it, do it. He didn't ask. So I'm telling you in advance, you can give it away. You can give a copy of it to everybody in your church. You can't sell it. If you print it out, you got to give it away. And even though you spent money on paper, Freely you receive, freely you're giving it. Period. End of story. Not mine. It's kingdom stuff. It's available. You want it, you got it. It's going to be up and available at least through this coming Friday night, midnight. Maybe extended after that. I don't know. We'll see what the whatever the Holy Ghost says. So, uh, in the last... <laughs> few minutes, I don't know how long it'll be, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, I don't know. I'm going to read to you the things the Holy Ghost gave me when I got up two mornings ago. He woke me up with this, speaking this to me. I had to get up in a hurry and start writing it down, and I just wrote it down. And I have not done any major editing to what how he said it to me, and I wrote it down. So the following things are absolutely necessary for spiritual warfare to work for us and for us to win in doing it. Okay? First of all, we must believe that without him we can do nothing. We must stay humble and dependent on Jesus at all times. Number two, we must have daily, a, a daily life of prayer as the foundation for all, war, all warfare prayer. You can't just pray warfare. Every day, there, there needs to be connection prayer and fellowship prayer. We call it devotional, but those two are a part of what you would call devotional. Connection, making sure that you're, 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 there's a connection between you and the Lord before you start talking to him. And then the, uh, the, 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 uh, the fellowship prayer. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. That's the first part. Warfare or ministry prayer is at thy right hand. Your authority and power being exercised through me, uh, there's pleasure forevermore. And uh, I'm going to, every one of these, I'm going to go through in an individual lesson on them. Uh, hopefully, I'll get them all done by the end of this week and they'll be available as they're able to be processed. They'll process them faster than most of you will watch them. So, okay. Uh, number three. We must trust that our God is greater in us and for us than the devil and the kingdom of darkness. Number four, we must believe and trust that God loves us and that we never fear the devil. Because if we believe and trust the love of God, that casts out all fear. And God is, Jesus has specifically commanded us to not fear the devil. Number five, we must understand that no one is an expert at spiritual warfare, ever. Nobody ever becomes a, an expert. Therefore, the Lord alone will teach us the war if we will let him. We can learn, we can study the scriptures on it, we can, have, we can repeat the scriptures in our sleep. 
But if God doesn't give that to you as a revelation where the understanding of warfare becomes yours and you're participating because you believe that every one of us, as Paul said, is called to fight a good fight just like he did. And like he told Timothy, by the prophecies that went before on you, that you might war a good warfare. Paul's writings are full of references indirectly and directly about the, the people of God being in, uh, involved in a fight, in a war. Jesus' name. Number six, we must understand the nature of warfare from a biblical perspective. While we fight as an army, each soldier must fight their, part, their own part of the battle. That's the enemy right in front of them. So if I defeat the, the enemy right in front of you, you, me and you defeat the enemy right in front of you, and each one of us does that, our collective effort is going to put the armies of the enemy on the run. And as that happens, his command structure will begin to collapse. And eventually, we will receive the promise that the gates of hell will have to yield to the attack of the church. Number seven, we must follow Jesus as our captain. No two wars or battles are ever the same. He alone knows the battle plan for any and every engagement with the enemy. And this is spiritual warfare, not spiritual battle. Wars are made up of many battles. And to win the war, you've got to win the individual battles. And for the army of God, the church of the living God, to win the battle, each individual soldier must win their part of the conflict. Number eight, we must know who the enemy is and who he isn't. And again, Paul told us, he's the God of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the uh, print, he's has principalities and powers and rulers under him and wicked spirits in the atmosphere. Number nine, we must know what we are praying for and what we are not praying for. We cannot eliminate the devil. You're not going to be able to get rid of him, but we can bind him. Jesus said we have to bind the strong man if we're going to spoil his house. Three times he said it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he said that. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, will let every word be established. Are they established in you? Go back and read the context of those three places in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Read the whole discussion, and you'll find he is specifically talking about the devil and his kingdom and God's kingdom being manifested against the devil. I'll go into that more when this uh, this. Uh, subject comes up in the series of lessons. And this, I cannot tell you how important this is. We must always have the right motive for spiritual warfare. The motive is never to defeat the devil. The motive is to set the captives free. But to set the captives free, you've got to defeat the devil. You can't spoil the strong man's house and set the captives free that he's got bound without confronting him and defeating him. So you can bind the strong man all you want, but what good does it do if you don't spoil his house? So the motive is always the end game, the end purpose, the ultimate goal always is to see souls delivered from spiritual captivity. And the Greek word in the New Testament, especially in most places where the word captive or captivity is talking about, means to be a prisoner of war. So these souls that are bound are prisoners of war. Most of them didn't even know they were fighting a war until they'd lost. But somebody with the power to do so has got to set them free. That's what God's called us to do. He's called us to do that. So our motive is always, always not to play patty cake with the devil, not to go through some kind of thrill of dealing in spiritualism and just dealing with spirits. It, we are not devil chasers. We are not called to be devil chasers. I am not a devil chaser. I've never sought to be sensitive to the presence of the devil. I've, I've spent my whole life seeking to be sensitive to the presence of God. And if I'm in tune with God and he wants me to know that there's a devil present, he'll tell me. If he doesn't want me to know, I don't care to know. Therefore, <laughs> when I've had him on occasion come to my room when I'm asleep and wake me up, 
I refuse to engage in his games. Oh, it's you. And I go back to sleep. Why? Because unless the Lord's calling me to that battle, the only, way I, only thing I have to do to get him to go away is resist him. What does that mean? I just don't give him any credence. Now, there are times that I actually have to pray prayers of resistance. But the devil is not omnipresent, neither are his forces unlimited. He and every demon that left heaven with him as a fallen angel, they're a finite number. And it's a simple biblically, biblical proof that thousands, tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of, of angels that fell out of heaven weren't even allowed to be a part of the earth. They were bound in chains of darkness, reserved unto the day of judgment. So, there's, so, so Lucifer, who is now Satan, and his forces on the earth for the kingdom of darkness are very limited. Most of their effectiveness is through lies and intimidation, trying to use fear to get people to, to, to submit to him. That's why Isaiah says, when we get to heaven and see him, we're going to say, is this the one that caused all this trouble? You can take a three-year-old and put, the, put a light behind him at the right angle, and his shadow will be 10 feet tall. And we deal with the devil's shadow instead of dealing with the devil because we're feared, afraid. We're, we're fearful of him. I got into that too much. Number 11, we must have no grudges. We might, must not have anything against anyone over anything. Why? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said that when you, you, you're supposed to forgive so that you don't give... Uh, the devil advantage over you. We're not ignorant of his devices, Paul said. I'll go into that when that lesson comes. But grudges give the devil advantage over you. You can't defeat the devil in spiritual warfare if you're carrying unforgiveness toward anything or anybody. Number 12, we must be truly repented and covered by the blood. We, we overcome him by the word of our testimony, by the blood of the Lamb. Why? Because his number one way to try to defeat the child of God is condemnation. And the, believing and trusting the, the blood of Jesus that you and I, that's been shed for us and that we've been covered with and been washed in so that our sins are washed away, that is our protection against the lies of the devil trying to condemn us. Number 13, we must put on the armor of God. And every piece of that armor is significance. And there's a purpose for it. And if you ask the average Pentecostal, I would be shocked if 5% of them really truly understood what each one of those pieces of armor are and what, how we get it and what we do with it. Why? Because why do we teach it, the armor of God if we're not going to be involved in armor in, in battle? Because that's hot stuff to wear. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. So let's just have good church. All right. No wonder people don't do spiritual warfare. They feel how naked and exposed they are before the enemy. Now, I agree that David went out in the name of the Lord without any armor and defeated Goliath with a slingshot, which was a sling. Not a, We call them slingshot, but... But there, that's a slingshot with two things like this. A sling was a pouch on the end of two strings with a rock in it, and you, you spin it, and then you let go of one of the slings, which causes the rock to go in the direction in which you've, you've propelled it to go, or hopefully, once you're skilled at it, the direction you want it to go. That's all he had because that's what he had proven. But he had faith in God, and the Lord gave him victory. But he didn't cut off Goliath's head with a slingshot. He cut off Goliath's head with a sword. And that's the last battle in the book where David ever fought with a slingshot. He got his own armor, he got his own sword, and he became very skilled at using that score, sword. So how are we going to follow after David, our ancestor spiritually, if we don't even know how to fight like he did? And he was a man of war, and yet he was a man after God's own heart, and the Lord said he was a man that would do all of his will. Number 14, we must be under the covering of authority. You can't have authority unless you're under authority. 
That's why Jesus called the statements of the centurion great faith and that he didn't find anyone in Israel with that kind of faith because in Israel they did not have a revelation of spiritual authority. They didn't have it. They might have had it, but the people that Jesus was ministering to during his earthly ministry, they didn't have it because the man said, I'm, I, his servant was sick. This Roman army officer, his, his servant was sick. And so he said, he said to him, you don't have to come to my house. He says, just speak the word only because I am a man under authority. He didn't say I have authority. He said I'm a, under authority. And because I'm a man under authority, I say to this one, go and he goes, this one, come and he comes, and this one, do and he does. He understood that to have people obey you, you had to have somebody you obeyed. So the only way you can have authority that you exercise in spiritual warfare is to be under authority. And that authority is your covering. It's your protection. I'll go into that more in the lesson. We must be totally submitted, number 15, totally submitted and obedient to the will of God daily. We must understand who we are in Christ, both individually and as the church. Let me go back to 15. We must be totally submitted and obedient to the will of God daily. God is not going to use us to defeat the spirit of iniquity if we're living in iniquity and not doing the will of God, the will of the Father, Jesus said, is iniquity. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Jesus' name. Number 16, we must understand who, in, who we are in Christ, both individually and as the church. Number 17, uh, I, I can't get started on the, the, number 16 because if I do, I won't get to anything else. That is absolutely, you've got to know who Jesus says you are. The spirit of wisdom, wisdom and revelation and knowledge of that. If you want to peek at that, go read the last uh, 10 or so verses of Ephesians chapter 1. That's one of the places that will tell you who you are in Christ. We must, uh, number 17, we must be sensitive to and led by the spirit of the Lord. This is spiritual warfare. You can't do spiritual warfare by some method. Now, I, I wrestled in high school in gym class. I never went out for varsity wrestling. I didn't want to do what they, those guys did. And I had a full semester of wrestling at the Naval Academy. Everybody was required to do it. So I was taught all the basic moves and the principles of wrestling and all of that. But I'll tell you something right now. Anybody that had a method that, that they used in wrestling, they always ended up on the, with their back on the mat. You had to be sensitive to your opponent and to know how to respond to him to gain the advantage and put him on his back and hold him there. And only the Lord Jesus Christ can tell you and I that at any given moment of our praying. Number 18, we must know the parameters of God's promises what he promised to do for us and through us, and what he did not promise to do for us and through us. And I will leave that there for now. Number 19, we must understand and use authoritative praying, true prayers of faith. What does that mean? Jesus taught us how to pray faith in Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 11, 20, 21, 22, 23. I'll go into that later uh, in the lesson. Number 20, we must understand kingdom praying and its purpose. I've taught about that a lot. I've got eight lessons on Bible with the Bishop just on kingdom praying, but I will do one summary lesson for this series on that. Number 21, kingdom praying, of course, is what Jesus taught them how to pray in, in Luke 11 in response to their request and also what Jesus taught, which is the parallel of it, in, in Matthew chapter 6 and what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. Matthew chapter 6, I think it's verses 9 through 13, something like that. Uh, number 21, we must be able to pray in the Spirit. If you don't have any liberty in tongues at all, you are not going to be successful in spiritual warfare. You're not going to. I'm sorry. Well, you don't believe in that. Well, then go to the stands and sit there and wait on somebody else to fight your battles because you're going to get hurt bad if you can't pray in the Spirit. I'm not being mean. I'm not being sarcastic. 
I'm being as kind to you as I know how to be. Trust me, I've been doing spiritual warfare since November of 1971. I know what it means to win, and I know what it means to be to miss God and get beat up. I've known what it means to have to have the Lord come and 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 uh, and rescue you because. I decided that warfare was needed and I started doing it on my own and I stirred up something that I didn't wasn't in the will of God confronting. I'm telling you right now, if you can't pray in the spirit, which needs to be your number one priority, and I've got a, a 17 a lesson series on Bible with the Bishop teaching about how to learn to pray in the spirit. Your choice. You're welcome to do that. Learning to pray in the Spirit includes learning how to pray intercessory prayers as the Spirit of the Lord leads to pray through us. Number 22, we must understand and use properly the keys of the kingdom. There are people that think the keys of the kingdom give them the prerogative to bind whatever they want bound and loose whatever. They don't even know what they're doing. I'm not trying to be unkind here. They learned that from some TV preacher. They didn't learn it from the Bible. I didn't learn this from anybody else. Brother Cole is the one that started me on this journey. But I did what God knew I would do when, I, when he did that. I've been studying spiritual warfare from the book since November of 1971. It's in the book. It's in the book from the beginning to end. Spiritual warfare started in the garden before they ever left the garden. Eve lost a battle she didn't even know she was fighting. And the, and the Lord pronounced enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And that that enmity would continue until finally the serpent's seed was cast into the lake of fire. And the father of that seed, Satan himself, was also cast in the lake of fire. So this conflict started in the garden. And it's not going to be done until after the great white throne judgment when Satan himself is going to be cast in the lake of fire. And that conflict's going on. You can live in denial of it if you want, but if you're living in denial of it, it's because you're already a prisoner. You're already bound. You're bound by the spirit of religious tradition. You're bound by the spirit of iniquity. You think the devil wants to stir you up and you realize how bound you are? Huh. You want to find out how bound you are? Just try to come against the one that's got you bound. Find out how that works out for you. That's why you need people to pray spiritual warfare to get you you delivered from the spirit of tradition. Sorry, that's not the purpose of this. So 22 uh, is we must understand and use properly the keys of the kingdom. The Greek is literally, the Greek grammar literally is this. Jesus said, unto you I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you, ha you bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. In other words, the binding and the loosing originates in heaven, and we're nothing but the conduits for it. And we don't bind what the Holy Ghost doesn't tell us to bind, that God has purposed to be bound, and we don't loose what the Holy Ghost tells us to be to loose, that the Holy Ghost uh, 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 that wasn't predetermined by the Father to be loosed. And when I prayed that very first prayer of binding and loosing on the last Friday night of November 1971, in the in the in the uh, the the uh, upper up op, open upstairs of my house, along with seven six other people, I said things in the Holy Ghost I never heard before, and couldn't believe were coming out of my mouth. But the Holy Ghost was praying them. I had to go back to the Bible to make sure they were in the book, and they were. I wasn't praying what somebody else prayed, and I wasn't praying what 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 uh, what I read to pray. The Holy Ghost prayed that through me. And then I found out as I went, which I always do, go back to the book to confirm whether or not it's in the Bible. And it was, and it worked. Praise God. Uh, number 23, we must understand the necessity of perseverance and how and why we are, we pray prevailing prayer because it's war. And no, you don't start a war. You don't plan on winning. That's what the Lord said. You count the cost. You don't go out to war against somebody till you first count the cost and decide 
You're going to fight that battle till you win. Otherwise, you just surrender. The casualties will be too high for a war you're going to lose because you didn't count the cost. And the armor of God doesn't protect children of God in, def- in retreat. It does not. That sword of the Spirit that, and, and that shield of faith, they're in your hands with your back turned to the enemy. You will be defeated. You'll be defeated. He's not going to let you get away. You've challenged him. Now you've run in fear. Yeah. So, better to keep on fighting. Stay on your feet and win the victory than it is to fight a little bit and say, whoa, this is not what I counted, considered it was going to be and run. Number 24, we must expect the counterattack and discern it. This is war. And most counterattacks start with coming against your peace in here and with all kind of stuff going through your mind you can't get rid of. That is a counterattack of Satan. That's why Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And what is that? Casting down imaginations and every high thing. What? Every high thought, every high thing that exalted itself and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So this is where the counterattack is going to happen right here. It's going to try to come against your peace so you're fear, afraid and a war in your mind. How did Jesus win that war? He went back to the Word. He went back to the Word. And the word says, it is written, it is written, it is written, and he won. Number 25, we must stay vigilant and watch and pray at all times, even during what seems like lulls and warring. How many times did Jesus say and the disciples, the apostles say, watch and pray? It's in the scripture numerous times. That Those are military terms. That means... When there's not an actual battle going on, somebody needs to be on duty, on guard, watching for the approaching of the enemy so you can be ready for a counterattack. Number 26, you must have a resolve to pray until you win the victory. Don't start spiritual warfare if you're not totally determined to win. You've got promises you're going to win. But if you don't believe those promises... You're doing this because somebody else is doing it because it's cool or neat or you think it's something different to be involved with. You don't do this because somebody else is doing this. You do this because the Holy Ghost is dealing with you to do it. And he will give you a resolve that says, I don't know what's ahead. I don't know exactly what this battle is going to consist of, but I'm going to fight until I win because I've got promises to win. Number 27, I'm almost done. 27. We must understand that winning one battle is not winning the war. It's a war, and a war is made up of many battles. And some battles are over with fairly quickly, and some battles are very long and protracted. Guadalcanal in the Pacific in World War II was six months of some of the worst fighting in the entire World War II. But those Marines did not quit. They did not give up. And they finally beat a much larger Japanese force. And it turned the tide of the war in the Pacific because Guadalcanal was one of the first major islands that we tried to take in order to start our island hopping campaign against uh, our enemy in World War II. Thank God they're no longer our enemy as far as the people are concerned, but they were in World War II. And... Those Marines that went ashore at Guadalcanal on that first day, they didn't have any idea what they were going to face. And that many of them had no idea that they would never leave that island alive. <sighs> Number 28, unless you have no other choice, never war alone. I'm not talking about physically, but make sure there are others praying with you when you're praying. That's why this call to war 2020 effort is so critical. 
This is not in competition with the United Pentecostal Church over anything. Brother Bernard has been kept up to date on everything that's being done. Every every piece of paper, every, every email I've sent out, he's been copied on every bit of it. He's aware of all of it. And Sister Flo Shaw, our World Network of Prayer coordinator that, that I have great respect for her faith and desire and love for God in prayer, she has been kept up to date on every piece of paper. She's been copied on every email I've sent out about all of this, starting all the way back in January, I guess it was. I don't remember exactly the first the time when I sent out the first one, sometime this year. I'm not competing with them. How stupid is that? We need all the help we can get. You know, at D-Day, there were four separate landings. They were all critical. Each one of them faced different enemies and different foes, but they were all necessary for establishing a beachhead. I pray in Jesus' name that the Call to War 2020 effort is not the only one that people are participating in throughout this world. In fact, I know for a, I know definitively it is not. World Network of Prayer has their effort going on, and I know other pastors in this country, and I know pastors or missionaries around the world that have their, their people praying, and they're doing it according to the way they feel led to do it. That's not it. I'm not in competition with those guys. This isn't about me. It's about souls. It's not about people following me. It's about people following the Holy Ghost. And however people are told or led, to do that, I, I got a couple of emails this week. I'm participating with, with Brother So-and-so in, in, in his app. Praise God. I'm thrilled to death. Thrilled. The Americans came, to, came ashore on Utah Beach, and, uh, and, and the British came ashore, and the, 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 the Canadians and others came ashore in a couple of the other. <coughs> And so it was, it was a, 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 a simultaneous warfare on four different beaches by different armies that had different generals over, but they were all under the, large, uh, under the authority of Eisenhower and, the, and the, 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 uh, the, the strategic commanders of that battle. And Jesus is our captain. You participate with who you feel to participate with. Please, just participate. It's the time. And in closing, I'm going to read a couple of things here. The Spirit of the Lord will make up for our deficiencies in these things if we will allow Him to while He teaches us and fully equips us for victory. We're not ready for war, but we weren't ready for war on December the 7th, 1941. We were at war whether we wanted to be or not, and we had a lot of uh, making up to do really quickly. God started this. God's called this war to start, whether we're ready or not, whether we're equipped or not. So we're going to have to war the best we can while he's equipping us, while he is teaching us and organizing us. We can't stop and, and wait till we're that way. The, 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 the souls of man and the eternity they're facing is way too critical. For us to wait, we've been waiting. I've been waiting over 40 years for, the, for this day. I've been waiting 40 years for it. And the Lord's not waiting anymore. So even if you don't know what you're doing, but God is do, talking to you, pray, just pray. Tell him, I don't know what to, I'm doing here, Lord. Teach me, teach me. And take advantage of the other teaching that's out there by whomever, however they teach. If they teach it a little bit different than me, so what? Follow somebody's teaching. Do something. Do something. Because we've got a promise that the gates of hell can't prevail. And we've got to go to war. We've got to go to war. In World War II, America had to suffer some serious defeats in order to learn where they needed to improve. It can be accurately argued that the defeats ultimately led to victory because they forced us to face the things that needed to be changed. Sometimes the urgency of the situation demands that we war even when we're not properly trained and equipped until we can learn, adjust, and receive the necessary complement of additions to ourselves in our efforts in understanding 
training, and experience so that we can become battle-hardened combat veterans who can win any battle and therefore the war. America didn't invade Europe, by the way. We went to North Africa. We started in the Pacific. We started in, in the European War, but we didn't start in Europe. We started in North Africa. We started initially with our carriers in the Pacific just trying to keep the Japanese at bay while we got stuff organized and got ready and got some more stuff built. And in Europe, we went to North Africa and fought in those sands out there to get some experience so that we were no longer greenhorns in combat and we, we became combat-hardened veterans and it was those combat-hardened veterans that was the core of the effort that won the war in both uh, Europe and in the Pacific. And there's some of us that have never done any spiritual warfare. And we're going to have to do some fighting. And we're going to have to take our licks and know that the Lord is there to help us and he will heal us and then train us and equip us once we finally realize how much war this is war. We're going to experience some defeats. Some of us are going to be defeated in some of this. Not taken captives, but defeated. We're going to get some wounds. We're going to have some difficult days. But those days are intended to strengthen our resolve. That this is a fight to the finish. And we've been told what the finish is going to be. As long as we endure to the end. Not survive passively, but press on aggressively until we win what he promised he would give us. So I close today with this, 2 Timothy chapter one, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is, it, that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast learnt, heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also should be four generations of teaching going on. Paul, Timothy, the ones Timothy was teaching, the, one that Tim, the ones that Timothy taught was teaching. This needs, what you receive, you're supposed to be passing on to others. That's the will of God. That's why I've had some say to somebody, what if we don't have the whole church? Well, we're not going to have the whole church. We're not going to start with the whole church. We just have to start with some that are willing to fight and become battle-hardened veterans so they can teach others what they've learned for themselves. Because the experienced spiritual warrior is a far better teacher than the one teaching out of his intellect because of something he's read or heard. But you got to fight to get experience. you got to war to gain experience in spiritual warfare. So therefore, Paul said to Timothy, verse 3, Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for the masteries, yet he, yet he is not crowned, ex, except he strive lawfully. Amen. The husbandman must be, that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Now, this set of notes, as bare bones as you will find them to be, will be put up on apostoliciron.com today under downloads. And you can go back through this list of things and know what lessons are going to be taught and what are coming. They're going to be taught in part one and part two 16 lessons in each part, and they will talk about these essential things from the biblical perspective that we need to know and understand. Now, we can fight till we get all that. We can keep fighting while we're gaining that, gaining that training, gaining that information, that knowledge. And when that's done, I'm going to teach the, the fundamentals of spiritual warfare as a re the revelation of warfare. And all that will be available no charge on uh, 
on Bible with a Bishop channel on YouTube. And if you subscribe and hit notification, you'll get an email or some kind of notification to let you know every time one of these lessons has been posted and it will be available to you. And you are welcome to use them however you choose to use them. Show them to your church, have your, your people watch them, uh, delete YouTube from your devices and tell your people not to watch any of this. That's between you and God. I'm just, I'm doing my part by obeying Jesus and what he does with it after that is his business. Whether it's received or rejected, not my problem. I cast that all on him and he can worry about it because I'm not. I'm not worried about it. So, this is directive number two. If you want to be a part of the directives when they go Zoom only or at least Zoom primarily, you will need to send an email to uh, ctwzoom at an apostolic iron spelled together dot com and uh, let, we need to know who you are, what your position is. If you're a pastor or another minister, even if you attend a church someplace, but you're not technically under that pastor's authority in the sense that you're under, uh, you're a part of their ministerial staff and their effort, then you're welcome to sign up on your own for yourself, your church, or for your end of whatever. If you are a minister, I don't care if you've had your license a year or 101 years. If you're on a ministerial staff of a pastor, you have to have his written permission attached to your email requesting to be put on the email list so you can be given the links to participate with the Zoom directives. Okay? This is the way I was told to do it. These are the instructions I was given. This is the instructions I'm giving you. They're not secretive. Any minister who is a pastor or in some other kind of uh, itinerant ministry or oversight ministry, official or whatever you are, you're welcome to participate. No secrets. But we need to be able to give direction to uh, preachers because this direction, this isn't about calling everybody to repentance. I preached stuff that went to everybody. I had no control over who it went to. I was told to preach it. I preached it like I was told to do it. It went to everybody. And I know that there are some saints that got it and prayed and whatever that their pastors didn't. It wasn't the goal. It wasn't the purpose. I was just obeying Jesus. But in this, in this warfare effort, I will not be responsible for giving direction for where warfare to a saint where their pastor is not involved in it and is not providing the covering. And if you're a saint and you're frustrated with that, I'm very sorry. I'm doing you a favor. You can pray on your own with your pastor's permission of however you pray, and whatever you do, that's between you and him. But I'm not going to be responsible for somebody entering into this warfare having stepped out from underneath the covering of their pastor who's not called to be out from underneath the covering of your pastor. Not going to do it. Not going to be responsible for that. So I understand, the, I understand the frustration of some. I've gotten some communication, and I have not responded to one of those emails. Not one. I have received communication from saints. But I challenge you to find the email that I responded to them. I did not. I have not. Not going to do that. That's between them and God and them and their pastor. Not my problem. I did what I was told to do, and I'm doing what, I was, what I'm told to do now. What I'm told to do now in actual, and actually now that this warfare has been activated, and I am one of the voices, and there will be a group of men that's already in the process of being formed, it would be a group of men that will work with me to help guide the Call to War 2020 effort. And again, I know there are other efforts going on, and I'm not competing with them. We're not competing with them. We're joining with them in the same purpose and goal, to see souls saved. 
and to participate in the warfare that will help bring that about. Now, this went longer today than I thought it would, but these are things that needed to be said. And if you hear some stuff, refer them back to this. This will be on Apostolic. It'll be on my personal Facebook page, on my Apostolic Iron Facebook page, and it will be on my uh, Apostolic Iron YouTube channel page. So I have two YouTube channels, Apostolic Iron, and and then the uh, the teaching series uh, channel, which is Bible with the Bishop. Everything on Bible with the Bishop are teaching series. Everything on Apostolic Iron is uh, is is stuff that the Holy Ghost has spoken that may or may not be directly connected to anything else on Apostolic Iron. All of that is available. It's all available. So. If anybody's got a question and they want to know the answer rather than just using what they think is the answer as an excuse to not do this, then there's plenty of people. Plus, if they want to talk talk to me, if they care, which, of course, is what the Bible says, if you have a problem with your brother, you go to your brother, not to your neighbor. So if somebody's got a problem with all this, email me. I'll talk to you. Email me. I'll talk to you. Absolutely, I will. Any questions you've got, I'll answer them. But for you to go talk about it to somebody else without without obeying the Bible makes you very wrong, doesn't it? And I'm inviting you to obey the Bible. For your sake, please obey the Bible. I got nothing to hide. And nothing to hide. So if you're hearing talk out there about this, that, and the other, and he shouldn't do this and that and the other, ask them the question. Have you talked to Brother Wright? Ask them. Have you talked to Brother Wright? And they're going to turn red and go and stammer and stutter. And, and you can say, well, don't you think the Bible says you ought to talk to him? Or he won't talk to me? It's a lie. It's a lie. I will talk to him. All they've got to do is communicate with me by text message, email, or call me on the phone, leave a voicemail if I don't answer, and say, Brother Wright, I got questions about what's going on. I'd like to talk to you. And I will talk to you. Why? I got nothing to hide. I'm trying to obey God. So if there's people out there all up in the air over stuff, ask them one question. Have you obeyed the scripture? Have you talked to the, to the brother? He's our brother, isn't he? Ask him the question. Have you talked to the brother? If I've said something that's offensive to you, and you're offended, and you're running your mouth to everybody, i got a question. How come you haven't talked to me? And I'll tell you this right now. There's not one person out there talking. It's communicated with me. And as you know, the external board of trustees of Antioch the Apostolic Church, to whom I am submitted, a couple of my brethren had a problem. They, they weren't comfortable with the fr- Friday night, May the 1st. They met. They made a decision. They asked for the message to be pulled down. I did because they're my covering. Nobody else has talked to me. Nobody. So where's the word of God at? Where in the world do we get off posting on Facebook or getting on phone or Twitter or whatever and and, and blasting something that you haven't even obeyed the scripture and attempted to talk to the person that you're offended with? Oh, yeah, I know. So, praise God. This has uh, definitely been a little different than I thought it was going to be, but the Holy Ghost has said these things. And I'm saying to you right now, you can check it in the Holy Ghost all you want, but if you're discerning a defensiveness in any of this, you sorely missed it, my friend. I'm, not, I'm trying to help you. I'm at peace. I've obeyed God. I am used to people rejecting what I'm saying since a very young minister, because I've been given stuff to say that people don't like sometimes. 
I'm used to that. I gave that to God a long time ago and give it back to him regularly. I'm trying to help you with this because the body of Christ needs to be involved with confronting the kingdom of darkness. Because you hear me right now. I'm going to prophesy this to you, and it's the Holy Ghost. If the church doesn't come together and pray, you're not going to like what this country looks like after November. And that's not a political statement, and it's not. And it has nothing to do with an individual or a party or anything. You're not going to like if you think this country has essentially been taken over by socialistic concepts in the name of safety. You're not going to like. You're not going to like the the uh, the freedoms you're about to lose if we don't pray. And the church has the right to pray. We don't protest. We pray. Why would I want to stand on a street corner when I can stand before the throne of grace? Why in the world would I want to be writing and blasting politicians and leaders who are doing the best they can, but this is out of their control? When I can come before the throne of grace. And if we don't come before the throne of grace, and use his authority and his spirit to war against the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of iniquity that doth already work. The kingdom of darkness is in the world, blind in the minds of people, so they can't believe and be saved. If we don't do that, if we don't take up the Lord's cause and do this, we are not going to like where all this ends up. Look how I know the Great Depression was horrible. And FDR was a hero because he came in and he was the first president to put us in deficit as a nation. And he spent all that money and put us in debt to try to get the economy going. And our economy's been built on a house of cards ever since because it's virtually impossible to function as a country and even begin to pay off the, the 22, was probably up now to about $25 trillion in national debt. And if that doesn't scare you, you need to get the sand out of your ears because your head is the sand. Your eyes are in the sand, your hair, ears are in the sand. And I'm not talking about politics and government and, and all of that stuff. I'm talking about biblical principles of things that are coming down the pipe here. And you're, if you're not praying warfare, you're going to take the path of least resistance. You're going to take it. If you don't learn to discern the God of this world at work, the spirit of iniquity at work, and, can, and confront him and resist him so we can have end-time worldwide apostolic revival and harvest, then you're going to become a prisoner of war. And you will sell your soul for peace and safety. I know I could have talked this whole time and it would have been all right, wouldn't I? Except for these last three to five minutes, right? I'm not talking about a party. Not talking about a man, not defending a man, not depending, defending a party. It has nothing to do with this. I'm talking about the God of this world. I'm talking about the spirit of iniquity. I'm talking about the direction this world's going in, in relation to God. And the church is not supposed to go with the world. The church is not supposed to love the world. In fact, to love the world, the scripture says, is enmity with God. And he's not talking about the people. He's talking about the system, the cosmos, this system of things. That's the Greek word, cosmos. It's a system of things. If you love this system, you're part of this system. Baptize any way you want to baptize. Have people talk in tongues till they can't even talk in English anymore, and you're on the wrong team. Because those things alone don't make you on the Lord's team. It's doing the will of the Father every day that puts you on the Lord's team. Just ask Jesus, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your goodness and mercy and blessings. I thank you for speaking to us today. I commit this word into your hands. I commit it to the ears, to however they heard it. Some will hear this word as very clear word from you, Father. 
and respond positively, and some won't even come close to hearing that, and they will rise up against it. I commit all that into your hands, Father. That's your problem. It's your business. I pray for each and every one of us that we will do your will, that we will please you, that we will obey you. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon our souls, our families, our churches, and have mercy upon the backsliders of this world and have mercy upon the lost of this world. In Jesus' name. Because it's already almost two here, I'm asking you to give me until 3 p.m. today, my time, to get those documents on the website for you to be able to download. God bless you. In Jesus' name, I will be live tomorrow at noon with directive num- Call to War 2020 Directive number three. God bless you. In Jesus' name.